Hello, my name is Alexandra Vakru, and I'm the Executive Director of the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies. And I'm pleased to welcome you back to another Davis Center webinar. Today, we're going to be talking about digital dictatorship and whether this is a risk in Russia. I'm happy to have two people, two specialists, to talk with me today. The first is Alyona Popova. She is a human rights activist and the founder of the Ethics and Technology Think Tank. She advocates for digital rights and using technology for the public good. And to this end, last year, she launched two campaigns, the Stop Hacking Humans and one against facial recognition technology to address issues of privacy and autonomy. She also started a legal battle against Moscow's plan to build one of the largest facial recognition networks in the world. Alyona holds a law degree from Kutafin Moscow State Law University and a journalism degree from Lomonosov Moscow State University. I'm also joined by Kirill Karateyev, who is the legal director of the Moscow-based Human Rights Center Memorial, where he specializes in taking cases to the European Court of Human Rights. He's worked on human rights issues in a number of Eurasian countries and has also taught public law. He graduated from the Higher School of Economics in Moscow and holds a master's degree from the University of Paris. Thank you for being with us today. So I wanted to start with a question for you, Alyona. Um, our, the title of our presentation today is on digital dictatorship. And I wanted to ask you what steps the Russian government has taken so far to establish a higher capacity for digital surveillance and what the risks are, perhaps to the state, but especially for the population. Thanks a lot for your question. I am saying hi from our digital zoo, or we call it digital concentration camp and i'm in shock about that so i'm sitting in my flat and to go out from my flat i need to ask the officials the moscow officials to give me the digital pass so russian authorities like to use all the new technologies so we have a quote of our president putin in which he said that who monopolizes the sphere of artificial intelligence of big data becomes the ruler of the world so this is the main reason why they collect all the data in one hand they accumulate in all that big data. And after that, they would like to build this authoritarian digital dictatorship regime. So it sounds awful, but it's true nowadays. So uh, COVID-19 outbreak is already used by our authorities as a reason for a significant, significant increase uh, in digital surveillance as we see it here. Uh, many citizens, and it's also many citizens, are willing to sacrifice part of their human rights and part of their digital human rights uh, to protect themselves from a pandemic. But for sure, the pandemic will end, but the elements of digital dictatorship will persist for 100%. Um, so uh, they created a total surveillance regime now in Russia because they have all the part of uh, uh, this uh, digital dictatorship in their hands. Like they collecting all the data illegally from mobile operators, largest banks, internet providers, local social networks, you know that we have Vkontakte is a copycat of Facebook and Adnaklasnik is a copycat of uh, classmates that you have in the US. So they collected all this personal data and they provide government access to personal data with no any law. So the huge amount of our personal data are accumulated uh, through the law enforcement and state, state uh, healthcare system, tax services, and et cetera, et cetera. So uh, they can organize a surveillance for every citizen easily, but the main aim, and we are sure with Kirill, that they would like to create the social engineering camp. Like uh, they would like to predict our behavior to manipulate us, and they want, they want not only uh, keep an eye on us, but to manage our society and to manage us as a human being. So now it's critical moment for civil society in Russia, and I'm sure. So the fundamental human rights should not be exchanged for protection against coronavirus. Thank you, Kirill. Let me uh, let me follow up with a question to you. You've specialized in taking Russian cases to the European Court of Human Rights. What kind of human rights violation do you uh, anticipate uh, in connection with this uh, the increased digital surveillance regime? Um, good afternoon, and uh, just I have to start with saying that um, I'm no uh, no longer the legal director of Memorial. I changed jobs last year, so I'm currently leading the international practice of 
Agora International Human Rights Group, another Russian NGO, and we are a network of lawyers working on the human rights cases. So my responsibilities are largely the same. And I also, for the sake, I think, of clarity, have to say that um, I represent uh, Alona before Russian courts and uh, soon before the European Court of Human Rights. So um, I'm involved at least in part in the litigation she initiated. Now, with regard to human rights violations and how they happen in Russia in this regard, I think uh, we need to start with telephone tapping because this was the field where Russian authorities first uh, so sort of tested more or less uh, successfully the uh, surveillance uh, technologies. And uh, this is this system uh, which was found to violate European Convention on Human Rights in 2015 uh, in the Grand Chamber judgment of the uh, European Court of Human Rights. The court said that uh, Russian regime concerning telephone tapping and data retention was such that uh, the um, executive authorities, the law enforcement, operated without any independent uh, oversight, be that by judges or be that by other institutions, parliament, prosecutors, ombudsman, whoever else. Uh, so the risk is that uh, there is uh, access to uh, what we do online uh, from the law enforcement, and there are no um, counterbalancing remedies. So no one can ever establish whether that access is uh, exercised well, uh, proportionately and on the basis of law. So this now uh, happens with all other uh, digital rights restrictions, be that uh, the so-called Yerovaya package, Yerovaya BOD law that requires all our electronic communications be stored by providers for six months and metadata even longer. This is the situation with, uh, for example, facial recognition technology, and there is a campaign that Alena started against it together with litigation, which I'm in charge of in part. So um, again, uh, there is no uh, legal provision, there, is no, there are no remedies to ensure that all these technologies are used on the basis of law and are not used disproportionately. That is for, per for the purposes for which it is possible to use them like fighting crime. Uh, with facial recognition there, we have good uh, evidence that it may be used, for example, uh, for tracking political opponents. And that is extremely dangerous and that was almost clearly admitted by Moscow authorities already. So uh, the dangers are multiple and um, uh, the, the, uh, we, we still need to oppose uh, as best as we can to the new initiatives that you know, create further uh, problems for our privacy, for our political expression, for uh, our public participation. Are, are there any legal rights to digital privacy in Russia? Oh, well, there is no specific, uh, you know, uh, right as such, but there is very weak data protection legislation, which is still violated by most of the new measures. And there is Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights, which guarantees right to privacy and which has been extensively interpreted by the European Court of Human Rights. So we have this international oversight, uh, at least to some extent, uh, 
and Article 8 of the European Convention was interpreted as to cover uh, many of the digital rights, including internet traffic, including emails, uh, including messages, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And of course, all your samples and data that is stored by the government. Aliona, let me uh, follow up on the question of facial recognition technology. Can you tell us what the what the status of implementing um, this network is in in Russia right now? What it was, say, before the pandemic, and how it might have been stepped up? Uh, just how how far advanced is it? Is it like China's system, or is it not quite there yet? You know, it looks like in China. So I think that they're he's a huge fans of China's system and they're just copying it in Moscow and in regions. So uh, now they use it to recognize uh, all the people who would like, no, who, who need to be uh, uh, like isolated from the society just because our authority decides that all the people need to sit at home uh, with no any reason sometimes. So if you go out from your flat or from your house, um, they can catch you in the streets using the special recognition system. And we have one case in Dalny Vostok in which a fee or uh, like a fine was sent to uh, the women. She was wrongly recognized by this crazy facial recognition system as uh, the person who violates the uh, mayor prescription to stay at home. So she needs to pay a huge sum of money just because the system incorrectly uh, recognized her as the wrong person. Um, but mainly they use the special recognition system just to control us as the citizens, us as, uh, I don't know, like uh, uh, the citizens of Moscow and the citizens of Russia. And uh, today, the uh, Sabianin, the mayor of Moscow, suggested to other regions to use a digital pass firstly, and other to use or to widespread uh, the facial recognition system because it's really effective, as he said. So just to, to get an understanding, is, is it software that's then uh, applied to existing CCTV cameras or is it new cameras and new networks that are being established specifically for the objective of, of using the facial recognition program? No, they use the CCTV cameras and they uh, load the new technology, like it was produced by uh, Rostec uh, company. You know that the owner of the Rostec is a big friend of our president. His name is Chemizov, Sergei Chemizov. So this is just a software and they load the software to the CCTV. They use more than 200,000 cameras all over Moscow. Mm -hmm. And the data is all being processed in Russia, because I know, for example, in some of the Central no. Asian countries that are establishing facial recognition software, the data is actually processed in China. Nobody knows. So we ask with Kirill, our, you know, like, as we filed a lawsuit against Moscow government, I mean, the Department of Information Technology and the representatives of uh, Minister of uh, Interior, we asked them um, where they store our data. Can they present us the proof that they store our data inside Russia? And they couldn't. I mean, they asked that we can't. Nobody mm -hmm. knows where they store our personal data. But we know that you can buy uh, any personal data, like biometric data, um, just paying 5,000 rubles in darknet. Mm -hmm. So it means that they can't protect our personal data for 100%. I'm sure that they can't protect for a 1%. Mm -hmm. um, I have a, a question from the audience, which is what would it take for the Russian government to back away from some of the increased surveillance top, top, uh, tactics, public protest or international pressure? And do you think this is likely to happen? Let me ask uh, Aliona first and then Kirill. You know, I just, I think that we need to create like um, a digital opposition or a digital front opposition. So we are starting to do that. So we collect in all the information, we unite people, we unite all the parties. So we send a lot of petitions. And I think we are lucky in that. Also, I think that we need to file many, many lawsuits. So Kirill, 
uh, has a different point of view because he thinks that we need to use our resources uh, more strictly and more efficiently. Uh, but I think that we need to file more lawsuits to stop our officials uh, and to protect our personal data now. I mean, if we will wait for a year, it can be too late to start. But as I see, we have a lot of people in IT who support us very, very strongly. So they send me some news before this news or uh, these issues can be published by newspapers or official resources. So I am very well informed of what's going on from that side uh, of our, I know, not enemies, but officials. Um, also, we have a lot of people like human rights activists who would like to have uh, like digital uh, demonstration, demonstrations like we had two days ago uh, in Yandex. Uh, many people use Yandex maps uh, to create or uh, to launch or to found, I don't know what, what uh, verb do I need to use, uh, this mass demonstration, mass digital demonstration. So I think it's perfect. So maybe people just wake up and they understand what we are fighting for because we are fighting for many, many years and we try to open up the eyes of our people and to describe the, the, the situation that it's awful. And now many people from regions send me a lot of questions. How can we act? How can we influence? So it means that we can unite many, many people and to fight against all this crazy regime. So it's something that's happening, not just in the uh, larger cities, but in, in smaller uh, cities and, and villages as well. Yeah, right. Uh, Kirill, so what's your perspective? You have, you have a different strategy. Uh, no, uh, well, uh, uh, again, I'm a lawyer, so I, represent people before courts but what from what i can observe is i can say that uh first well if there is something that uh, affects uh the russian government's policies is russia is pressure from the russian public opinion and um, that on many issues has been has proved successful or at least well has limited the damage the Russian government could have done. So that's one thing. And uh, Russian government is unable for many reasons to uh, abide by the judgments of the European Court of Human Rights or by the judgments of its own courts very often. I mean, if you've been a case in a district court, it may be not much uh, different for your client than uh, in Strasbourg. But, but uh, also, uh, it, it is reactive to the public opinion very much. And also uh, the developments in technology, I think, very often uh, render the technology used by the government obsolete. So that, uh, for example, there is a whole story of uh, Russian legislation on blacklisting of websites. Probably the most well known to the wider audience is LinkedIn, which is blocked in Russia. But of course, with VPNs, there is no problem whatsoever uh, to access LinkedIn. Telegram, which is a highly popular messenger in Russia and is used by the government itself, is officially blocked in Russia, but because the software has it, inbuilt um, VPN, you may use it relatively easily. So uh, the development in technology uh, also offers many ways to, uh, if not circumvene, if not defeat, then render obsolete or meaningless the, the um, uh, governmental attempts to restrict those. So here, lawyers, public opinion, and technology, if they go hand in hand, there is uh, there is room for progress. So let me let me break that into two different sections and first ask you about the uh, the legal avenue. If there's little uh, result from winning a case in Russia or in the European court. 
Uh, why do you think it's a successful strategy to, to take the government to court? Um, we need to do this, and uh, well, Russian courts will most likely, and they do decide in favor of the government on a routine basis, but uh, taking a case to Strasbourg, even though it, you know, um, uh, it takes uh, years and years, uh, may provide remedy both for the individuals and for uh, uh, the wider public as well. So uh, at least we may have a legal authority saying that uh, this or that provision, this or that technology is uh, contrary to the law that is binding on Russia. And uh, it may uh, help in all kinds of cases, especially when it comes, for example, to criminal prosecutions to have the President saying that, uh, you know, the technology used for uh, criminal prosecution violates uh, European Convention will make the defense then easier, if not domestically, than uh, in Strasbourg. And then on occasion, at least, uh, Russian courts review at least criminal convictions. So uh, there's been already a lot of uh, trouble for the Russian government justifying uh, criminal convictions with evidence obtained through telephone tapping after the Article 8 judgments uh, of the European Court of Human Rights. And there will be more and more troubles like that. So uh, it has this effect. It uh, also has the uh, effect as you know, putting the end to controversy so that we deprive the Russian government of any argument that they, uh, their, you know, technology is legal. So they say, yes, we use it because we can, but they cannot say, yes, we use it because uh, it is a lawful thing to do. Mm -hmm. So, and then let me ask the second part of the question, which is on capacity. So um, it's clear from what both of you are saying that the Russian government has the desire to introduce, for example, extens extensive facial recognition technology um, and to use technology to have more control over, let's say, people's digital lives. But do they really have the capacity to do that, right? There seems to me a huge difference in how, say, the Chinese implement the use of QR codes in Wuhan to Take, uh, keep track of people and what happened in Moscow when these uh, passes were introduced and people were stacked up at the metro entrances. So is there is there a real state capacity to implement the rules that they might like to? Let me ask Kirill if you can answer that first and then Aruna. Well, uh, in a situation of totally unprofessional law enforcement that is, uh, that makes, you know, uh, Russian governments, um, intentions very difficult to implement, I would say. And well, the most recent events in Moscow with digital passes were, I mean, best evidence, but that's not the only piece of evidence uh, we can get. But uh, again, uh, what I think the authorities are trying to do is precisely to uh, try to avoid involving human law enforcement officers uh, in whatever they do, because so far uh, it, all, all the, all the uh, surveillance systems depended very much on human officers, all the watch lists, uh, all telephone tapping and the like. So the authorities are trying to avoid this for the moment, precisely because there is less and less professional, well-trained law enforcement officers and employed. Uh, now, whether uh, they will be totally able to get rid of this uh, law enforcement is, uh, again, they are trying to, they are very far from succeeding. Aliona, what do you think about the capacity question? Uh, I think that they can. Uh, maybe not now, but in the near future. Just because they collect and all the data with the help of state-owned corporations like Yandex Taxi, for example. We all use Yandex Taxi. Also, we all use Bearbank cards, credit cards, debit one. 
So in Sberbank, they created the special laboratory. So it's the name of the laboratory, Neuroscience and Human Behavior Laboratory, um, which is headed by Andrei Kurpatov, the famous psychologist here. And the main aim of this laboratory is to, you know, like to create our behavior, to create, it means that to manage us. And uh, Sberbank owned a lot of data, like what I buy, how I buy, how often I buy, how often I use Yandex Taxi, where do I go? Also, they can have this uh, base of our facial recognition data. Also, they can have our base of emotional mood. And also, they can, ha they can have in one base, for example, they can just... Um, I mean, like make it as a complex, my healthcare data. That's why they, they can manage me in the future, I'm sure. Like they can social engineer me. They can, um, they can use all this data just to uh, manipulate me in, in times of election, for example. I'm sure that all, all their will is to uh, manipulate all the people during the election time because they need all, all the candidates they want to be elected, but not our independent opinion. That's why I'm sure, as I told you before, that we have only one year, maybe one and a half year, to stop this crazy movement of our crazy authorities um, in terms of using illegally our personal data. So it, se it seems to me there you're saying two different things. One is that um, there's a huge amount of data, uh, say, at the fingertips of the authorities, perhaps more than you would find in a country where um, the state doesn't control so much of the economy. So you have access to spare bank, health data, um, Yandex taxi, a taxi, all of those things. Um, and there's the desire, let's say, to to social engineer actions based on combining that data and doing something with it. But that still doesn't give me an idea of what the capacity of the state is to actually do that. I mean, do, do we know that um, the state is, is um, making progress in terms of analyzing that data and actually implementing new programs? Are there, are there partnerships with uh, private companies, for example, to do the kind of uh, coding that you would need in order to implement some of these programs? I mean, all the states on some level everywhere have the ambition to be able to access big data and, and do something with it, but it's extremely difficult to do in practice. What makes you think that the, the Russian government is, uh, is ahead of the game, given that they, they haven't performed that well? Again, just use that example on the, the, the QR codes. I am sure just because I am sure that they're dreaming about digital dictatorship. Uh, they were born in times of Soviet Union era, in which they learned, they, they learned that they can uh, just rule the world and rule the people, rule the society. It's all about them. So this is inside them. I mean, like our bureaucra bureaucracy. So um, I am sure that they can use all these crazy instruments very efficiently. Um, just because they spend a lot of resources uh, to code it, to promote it, to implement it, like many, many billions of dollars. Also, they hire some people from China to consult them. And it means that in the near future, these great consultants, I, I, I'm not joking, I think that the people from China are very effective in, in, in this special uh, consulting field. Uh, they know how to create all this total surveillance system because they have it in China from 2016. Um, and our government and our officials just spend our taxes for nothing. I mean, they spend it for, not for our welfare, but for uh, the mechanisms that can control us for a hundred percent or more than a hundred percent. That's why I am afraid of it. And, um, I think that we need to, to act today, not tomorrow. So Alyona is arguing for a kind of social action or the social campaign. Kirill, do you think there are any uh, legal steps that could be taken in order to slow the implementation of some of these surveillance regimes? 
Well, uh, we already launched uh, with Alona uh, several lawsuits concerning facial recognition. And of course, Russian courts uh, support uh, Russian government, on, Moscow government uh, on that matter. So facial recognition has been very much limited to Moscow. Now, uh, we otherwise uh, are engaged in um, many uh, cases going on domestically and in Strasbourg on issues like blocking of Telegram, on issues like internet shutdowns um, in in Moscow and in in Gushetia. Uh, in uh, I, I think it was a year and a half ago in in Gushetia during the protests over the. A border agreement with Chechnya, but uh, again, uh, I think that uh, in terms of you know when we think of slowing down the the uh, government's attempts to restrict uh, our liberties, it is uh, precisely the the uh, public reaction, uh, the criticism coming from the society that is more important. However, we also believe that you know court cases uh, may uh, at least fuel that criticism with arguments, and there's been, I think, quite uh, impressive coverage of the uh, cases uh, Alana took and of uh, other IT-related cases. Uh, so. Uh, court judgments or whatever appeals, applications to the European Court of Human Rights, they uh, you know provide the society with the opportunity to discuss uh, the matters of restriction of their digital rights and to express uh, criticism of government action. And once it is expressed, the government they, however dicta dictatorial it may look from outside, does have to care about it. One of the things that we've seen in connection with this pandemic is that um, you know, countries even like the United States, where people consider themselves to be free to do almost anything they want, um, are now in a situation of asking people to stay at home, to not go to work, to not go out on the streets. Um, all in the name of trying to fight the spread of the of the COVID-19 virus. Are there any cases that you think that greater surveillance and the reduction of individual rights are justified? Is, is this pandemic perhaps one of those cases? I don't know, let me start with you. Well, I think Kirill can start because he is in the headquarter of uh, Agora organization and they help to all the people from all over Russia in, in these special cases during the COVID-19. Okay, Kirill? Uh, yes, well, um, you know, there are, I think, two sides to this problem, and uh, we are in the face of an incredible global emergency, and of course, uh, this situation may allow uh, certain restrictions on human rights and the law as it stands, uh, European Convention on Human Rights, ICCPR, Russian Constitution allows for such restrictions. Now, these restrictions are, of course, not a carte blanche for the government to enact whatever it uh, seems fit. And uh, it's been impressive that uh, Russian public has been demanding for now several weeks that a Russian government enacts, uh, you see, a, uh, um, um, a foreseeable and a foreseeable set of restrictions, be that situation of emergency, which is one set of rules, be that state of emergency, which is another set of rules. Because for the moment, what we are facing with limitations in uh, coronavirus times is that they are chaotic, they are self-contradictory, they are very often uh, in violation of the law, 
uh, and well, the legislation before the 1st of April had some system which was now masked by a legislative re reform rushed through the parliament. So uh, I think the society would accept uh, certain restrictions and even it asks for it asks for uh, such restrictions be enacted, but uh, if they are you know foreseeable, if they are limited in time and in scope, and we are getting quite the opposite of uh, what was expected of the authorities uh, under the law and by what we can see as expression of uh, public opinion, and finally, of course. Uh, all the regimes that had existed before the 1st of April, all the emergency powers uh, provided for um, the obligation to compensate anyhow the damage caused uh, by the emergency measures. Now, uh, we understand that's probably part of the uh, reason for the chaotic uh, legislation that we now face is that uh, the uh, government uh, doesn't want to provide financial compensation or fi even financial assistance to individuals who suffer from uh, lockdown the most. If it provides uh, financial assistance, it is always and again to its uh, big business friends rather than to those who lost their jobs or lost their income. What, uh, what just to, to follow up on that, what is the legal status that you think is most appropriate for the current situation based, based on uh, what the options are for the Russian government? Well, uh, I think it should have been uh, either the quarantine, I think the most appropriate was quarantine and the sanitary legislation, um, alternatively, probably uh, a state of emergency. Uh, um, under the decree of president that would be approved by the Council of the Federation. But we are now living under the law which was designed to, you know, act in situations like, well, uh, uh, an earthquake uh, or a flood, which, mm -hmm. of course, it may be uh, highly damaging to Sakhalin, but uh, completely unnoticed in Aro or in Ivanovo, and we mm -hmm. are in a situation where everyone is affected. So um, quarantine for medical reasons, probably state of emergency. Mm -hmm. Aliona? You know, I disagree with Kirill. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes this happens, <laughs> yeah, just because I think that they can't violate our right to privacy and autonomy um, due to this special law, um, which is about nat natural disaster, uh, for example, just because in that special law it said that, that they can't restrict any personal right of uh, citizens. It means that my personal human right to my privacy is protected by the constitution constitution still exists thanks god uh, so they would like to change it but now we have the previous version of constitution in which it said that my right to privacy protected by constitution it means that they can't ask me for digital pass that they can't use facial recognition because i have my human right to my privacy so uh, I agree with Kirill just in, in, in one thing is that we need an emergency state here, but I'm sure that maybe we don't need it because we have this bad system. In the emergency state, they can just take out our cars with no any, you know, like compensation for that. They can restrict our human rights with no any reason. Uh, just because they announced this emergency state. So I'm sure that it's um, more, um, more effective for us or efficient for us now to have the quarantine regime, but the quarantine regime is not announced by our government. They called it self-isolation regime. What is self-isolation with all these crazy measures of controlling our uh, citizens and violating of our human rights. Self-isolation means that I am by myself as a citizen decide to stay at my house. 
myself with no any restrictions from outside. I mean, from from not outside, but from uh, the side of our authorities. But they control all, all my moving. They control all my decisions. So they act like they announce the emergency state. So for me, it sounds crazy. I mean, it's illegally, and that's why they can't uh violate any human rights because we don't have emergency state we don't have quarantine we have this uh self-isolation regime Mikhail, would you like to respond well i don't think there is much of a disagreement uh quite unfortunately on the first of april the piece of legislation that was rushed through the parliament allowed for uh, restrictions on of uh, human rights uh, under this natural disasters law under which all the restrictions were enacted uh, now the thing is that the current situation uh, unlike state of emergency allows for for, uh, I mean, it, it's really uh, the, the provision that allows to enact any restrictions, which is highly problematic uh, from the um, point of view of constitutionality. Now, the uh, thing is that if state of emergency was enacted, uh, the limitations that uh, could be enacted in a state of emergency are limited by the constitution. Uh, and, for example, it is not possible in a state of emergency to limit the uh, right to fair trial and to uh, legal protection before the courts, whereas for the moment we can see that the uh, movement of lawyers, not even across the country, just across their um, you know, city of residence, is limited uh, quite considerably. Uh, if not made impossible, so uh, the uh, in in uh, you know we are already in a safe emergency you know but a name, and also without any uh, you know restrictions on uh, how much limitations may go. So in this respect, I would totally uh, here. Yeah, I think we um, uh, agree with Alena is that. Uh, quarantine under sanitary legislation is the most appropriate regime. And by the way, Russian borders were closed under the provision of that uh, sanitary legislation uh, allowing for the enactment of quarantine, uh, except that it's probably the only measure enacted under that piece of legislation, which is otherwise, I totally agree, is the most suitable. So one of the questions that's come up uh, in relation to the pandemic is the shortage of information about what's going on on the ground. So this is something that many countries have seen. We certainly see it in the United States. We don't know exactly uh, who has ventilators, for example. We don't know um, how many people are sick with the disease because there might not be enough testing. Um, and the answer to most of those questions is to have more information, more data, not less. Can you conceive of situations where the uh, big data collection could be used for good, um, especially in the case of the pandemic, or let's say in redistribution of welfare benefits or something like that? Or are you categorically against the collection of, of kind of consolidated information by the government? I don't know. I'm totally against it. Uh, just because I know how they will use our personal data in the near future. And also, um, as I as I understand now from their action, they can manipulate with all the statistics data. And also, we don't have any law in terms of anonymization of uh, our citizens. It means that all the data that they, that they can collect can't be anonymized because we don't know how to do it. We don't have any special law. So we were fighting for that law for five years, and now we don't have any special standalone law in terms of anonymization. So um, why I am against all this centralization uh, collection of all personal data, it's just because I know that they can't anonymize, uh, anonymize my data so they will know that me, it's me. And after all this pandemic case, they can use all my data just to manipulate me for sure, for a hundred percent as they act in many, many previous years. Do you agree, Kirill, that, that big data uh, is always bad? 
uh, well, um, I where I agree with Elena is that uh, the Russian uh, data protection legislation was designed not to protect our data from abuse by the government, but to um, you see uh, to have another leverage against private businesses which also happen to collect our personal data. And sometimes they do that, of course, in a manner that is damaging to, to us, but uh, all, all Russian data protection legislation is about to collect fines from them and uh, not protect us. Now, uh, another problem with information in, um, uh, in the times of uh, epidemics is that uh, Russia also enacted specific fake news uh, criminal and administrative provisions and now the investigative committee made uh, a prosecution for fake news about coronavirus their priority and while some of the prosecution concerns stupid statements like coronavirus doesn't exist or something like this, a considerable part of prosecution uh, consists in people voicing criticism as to the uh, absence of protection for the doctors as to the unavailability of ventilators, etc. So uh, voicing very uh, legitimate uh, skepticism, criticism, uh, raising questions about uh, the government preparedness for the epidemics. So in uh, here, um, the, the problem is that, uh, again, uh, <laughs> unfortunately, the Russian government is, in dealing with uh, its own population, it uh uses repression first so and and after you know repression is exercised uh no one really cares uh about uh the problem that underlined uh, the speech that was prosecuted so the uh the use um, of uh data here is very problematic as long as the government is limited to you know calculating the number of uh, ventilators it's probably fine but then there are again very uh, worrying uh, signs that for example uh, again moscow authorities uh, specifically collect and store the data personal data of people who were infected so uh, including their biometric data. So those who were infected or those who were uh, probably even tested negative, but uh, have symptoms of probably other respiratory sickness uh, and, and they might be put and the Moscow authorities already promised that under uh, digital supervision. So that is uh, again, uh, the way government in Russia operates is that uh, instead of using stimuli and instead of explaining what it does, uh, it prefers repression. So uh, again, a uh, point on which I would totally agree with Elena is that it cannot be trusted. Is there any and way- Can to... I add- oh, sorry, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. In sincerity of uh, its, its use. Sorry, I think Elena wanted to okay. add something. Yeah, I just want to add one thing. Uh, you know that on Friday, our uh, State Duma adopted the law. Um, the name of the law is like, how should I translate it? Like um, the storage of personal data information of the United storage of personal data information about citizens. So um, I just read this law and the law is crazy and they adopted it. And when I sent some letters and some messages to my, uh, you know, like to some MPs with the questions, how comes, how can you vote for that? Because you understand that this is all for digital dictatorship. So you can't vote for that. And all the answers were 
So, Alena, I'm so sorry, but I can't or I couldn't act um, the other way because I don't have or I didn't have any choice. So for us, it means that if we don't have any independent MPs in our state Duma, if we don't have independent people in our state government, so how can we um, be sure that our personal data will be protected by all that people? Did, 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 you, did you think that there were independent uh, members of parliament? I mean, is, was this a surprise or is it what you expected? No, for me, it was a surprise because I thought that we have three independent MPs. Of course, we have two, uh, I mean, like 4,050 MPs in our state Duma, but I have three, personally, I have uh, known three MPs um, who is independent, who are independent in terms of uh, protection of your personal data, but they voted for that. So mm -hmm. it was a huge surprise for me. So I wanted to ask um, if there are any protections in uh, in Russian law against people who come forward and say uh, that there's not enough PPEs, for example, for doctors and nurses, or who highlight some of the problems in the coronavirus reaction. Um, the the fake news law that you mentioned, Kirill, is being used against them. But is there any way to defend them? Well, uh, that's what we are trying to do, and that's what other NGOs and lawyers are trying to do. And uh, again, uh, the problem is that, uh, of course, you can't rely on Russian judiciary in believing that you know you will be given a fair trial by a competent judge that's mm, unfortunately not the case so uh, again uh, we expect uh, convictions being entered by russian courts and upheld on appeal uh, and and probably when it comes to administrative offense provisions there is you know very uh, limited uh, possibilities of defense so uh, you uh, the defendant e in administrative offense proceedings uh, cannot often uh, cross-examine witnesses against him or her. There is no prosecutor, so the judge uh, so uh, supports the prosecution and convicts at the same time and often uh, de uh, decides not to hear, for example, defense witnesses. That's uh, what you can see from uh, all the uh, convictions of peaceful demonstrators, for example. So uh, we are trying and other NGOs are trying to uh, ensure that every defendant in such cases uh, has uh, a lawyer to defend him or her and that defense is conducted most professionally to have then cases taken to the European Court of Human Rights because unfortunately it's the only independent and impartial, however imperfect court that has jurisdiction over Russia and uh, at least the person will get the hope, the judgment saying that his freedom or her freedom of expression was violated, some compensation, and we very much hope a review of the conviction. It will take quite uh, some time. But uh, again, we, we need to, you know, plan for long runs, uh, unfortunately, because um, well, if something is a priority of the investigative committee, no judge in Russia would oppose it quite unfortunately. And you're able to provide that kind of legal support across the country, not you personally, but there are there are uh, lawyers like you and your organizations that are, are working across the country? Uh, well, Agora, well, Agora is a group of over 100 lawyers, and most of them are in Russia, even though some are based elsewhere. Uh, so we are uh, covering uh, large chunks of the territory, and uh, we are always eager to, you know, uh, to cooperate with lawyers where we are not present. So. Uh, we've been able to take dozens of Les Majeste cases, for example. So when last year Les Majeste law was enacted, uh, first 
several dozen of defendants, we could reach every single uh, one of them. And here we can see that, again, not only Agora, but other NGOs are involved. And uh, again, together we are able to provide advice uh, and defense and court to uh, really dozens of defendants across the country. So. Uh, it is not easy. It is not always, you know, the same level of implication on our part because uh, there are uh, more available resources in one region than in others. But uh, nevertheless, uh, it works. And again, thanks to technology, thanks to social media, we are able to reach um, uh, to lawyers, to the defendants in matters of seconds and that is uh, that is the difference from the situation we had in this country like 20 years ago mm -hmm. where you could spend days telephoning here and there to uh, locate uh, the person the case or whatever that you needed so our, our time is almost over, but Aliona, I wanted to ask you, um, given, given what we've talked about and what you're worried about, what are you going to be uh, particularly focused on as the Russian response to the coronavirus intensifies? Uh, firstly, we prepare in uh, the, you know, like the lawsuit, uh, which can be copied by anybody who would like to file it. Uh, in terms of the violation of uh, the digital human rights of our citizens. And also we are campaigning against all the restrictions uh, that now we have in Russia, uh, especially against our Moscow authorities and some regional authorities, um, like in Tatarstan, for example, in which the regime is strictly um, I think like the most crazy in Russia, like if you're pregnant, you can't go to your doctor without any permission from the prosecutor, uh, sounds crazy. So um, also we try to unite all the people from IT sphere uh, to be with us and to create uh, the protection software against all this recognition and surveillance technology, uh, which is used illegally so the main word here is illegally if it it was legal uh maybe i i i couldn't act i couldn't act like that just because i can't ask you to act illegally but it's illegally we don't have any law in which is said that my human digital rights or my digital human rights can be violated just because somebody from my bureaucrats decides that they can do that uh, with the usage of my taxes. So uh, our main idea is to promote um, uh, the, this, you know, like um, no facial recognition campaign, stop, hu hu stop hacking humans campaign, and to inform uh, as uh, more people as we can uh, how they can protect their personal uh, human rights. Uh, and to help that people with some judicial advices. Kirill was mentioned, how can we do that? And Kirill, what are, what are you watching for in terms of the, uh, the official reaction to the coronavirus pandemic? Are there certain signs that you think would, would give us an indication that the government is moving in a more uh, repressive direction or less so? Well, the government keeps moving in more repressive direction, and today Moscow Mayor uh, Mr. Sebanian called for other regions to introduce digital uh, permits uh, for movement, and uh, he definitely leads on new restrictions being enacted. So. Uh, I think, uh, again, uh, vocal opposition again, and uh, also, you know, meritorious uh, opposition to such restrictions is something that definitely slows them. Um, we lawyers support uh, all uh, those who are affected. Uh, we 
are now very limited in our capacity to take cases to courts because of the lockdowns and because all the hearings you know get rescheduled until after meaning that for the restrictions enacted right now this will uh, have much less uh, effect than could have intended but uh, again uh, as long as we continue our work uh, opposing the already existing uh, restrictions opposing future restrictions that uh, will not make it easier for the government to enact new ones and uh, while not you know everything works uh, as it should have still i think uh, as long as lawyers uh, political and so uh, civic activists and it specialists are united in their response this definitely brings uh, results and we had prior evidence we had evidence already during these uh, epidemics and uh, we very much hope to continue to you know um, acting as watchdogs on our government they spend our money <laughs> All right, thank you very much, both of you. I've been speaking with Aliona Papova and Kirill Karateev, and it's been a pleasure. Thank you. It was. Thank you.